Allah says, فَكَشَفْنَا مَا بِهِ مِنْ ضُرٍّ We took away all the harm away from him. وَآتَيْنَاهُ أَهْلَهُ وَمِثْلَهُمْ مَعَهُمْ We gave him his family back and his children back and double their amount. We gave him wealth. Grasshoppers, like the shape of grasshoppers, of gold, began to rain onto Ayyub alayhi salam used to pick him up. No messenger comes to them with good news except that they mock him and joke about him. There was one prophet who came to a people and he called to them. This is in Surah Yasin. He said, Ya qawmi, my people, my people. He came running to them, a man from the end parts of the city. He wasn't actually a prophet, he was a nobleman. He said, oh my people, follow the messengers. Follow the ones who don't ask you for anything in return and they are guided, they're guiding you away from what will harm you. You know what they did to him? In the hadith it says that they grabbed this man and they told him, aren't you going to be quiet? Preventing us from our desires. We want to do what we want to do. He said, I am advising you to follow him because it's better for you in your life. They brought him and they threw him down the well. In another hadith, it says that they brought him and they stampeded on him until they crushed his bones and then they threw him down the well. Allah says in the Quran, It was said, enter paradise. This ayah, for those who analyze it, this ayah is saying that as if this man wasn't even judged, didn't even go through anything except that he was immediately from the well to paradise. It was said, enter paradise. Immediately he said, O oh, sorrow to my people, if only they knew what my Lord has given me in return and how he has blessed me and been generous to me. From the well to Jannah. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. Oh, great sorrow to the servants. Whenever a messenger comes to them for that which guides them, they tease them and they mock them. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, how much has Allah given us as well in the livestock and animals? Allah said in the Quran, look at the cattle. How he gives you pure milk from between, intestines and blood and feces inside the stomach. He gives you pure milk that is tasteful and healthy for you. Another ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet, we deny all of this and what He has given us. We forget that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on top of that, has given us this beautiful deen, this way of life. Allah says in the Quran, lakum deenakum. Today I have completed your religion, your way of life. وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي And have com completed my blessing upon you. What is this blessing? The deen, this way of life. This is a ni'mah. I have completed my ni'mah upon you. Meaning, this deen is the greatest ni'mah and the complete ni'mah that anyone can ever wish for and hope for. If you really follow it. وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am pleased with this religion of Islam submission for you as your way of life. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, what is this deen? Why is it such a blessing? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that this deen brings us life. It brings us guidance away from what can harm us and takes us away from those who do harm us and makes us become conscious and aware of the right from the wrong, which path to take and which paths not to take. There's no need to research too much anymore. Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. وَاللَّهُ يُرِيدُ أَن يَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ وَيُرِيدُ الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ تَبِعُوا شَنَّ الشَّهَوَاتِ أَن تَمِيلُوا مَيْلًا عَظِيمًا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفِّفَ عَنكُمْ وَخُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفًا Allah wants to forgive you. But those who are astray they always want to mislead you. Those who follow their desires and their temptations and their own lusts, they want to lead you astray from it. And to go far away from this beautiful way of life which is good for you and them. Allah, through this deen, He wants to lessen burdens and harm off you. 
even doctors today, and I come from a biomedical background, doctors say to you today, go to any doctor, to any medical practitioner, to any researcher, to any professor of science, and he will tell you, or she will tell you, that the best medicine is what? Is prevention. The best medicine is prevention. Prevention is better than cure. Allah is the one who before them brought us the guidance of how to prevent ourselves from something. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevent a drop of alcohol from drinking it, even though it won't get you drunk? Because He knows the effects of it, that later on it can be addictive, and it can cause you to drink lots of alcohol, which makes you drunk and corruption on earth. Why did He prevent us from, the ki from kissing a girl which we are not allowed, to, not allowed to, or looking at her? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that this can lead on to other problems. Why and why and why? So this ni'mah of Islam is the best thing that could ever happen to anyone's life. Even in a spouse relationship. Know, my dear brothers and sisters, that if there is any conflict between a husband and wife, it's only because one or both of them has done something haram. Abadan. Because everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has advised us will only bring the husband and wife together. Listen to this ni'mah of Islam. In which religion, in which society, in which culture, in which civilization does it command the man to give a bridal gift to the woman and she has a right to do whatever yani she pleases with it in the halal of course and the husband hasn't got the right to take it or ask for it and it's a debt upon his neck no matter what happens and that if she dies and he doesn't pay it he must give it to her heirs her father, her mother, her brothers, her sisters her, the ones who will inherit her who has that right? Except in Islam. Which one commands the man to work but doesn't command the woman to work? And if she wants to, she can, with her husband's permission. And if she does, her money is hers. Is hers. She is not obliged to pay it. Which religion tells you that if the man divorces his wife, for the next three menstrual periods he must provide her with shelter and wealth, and that for the rest of his life he has to look after the children, not her, even if they live with her? Which religion says that? Except for Islam. Which religion tells you that if your enemy that is fighting and holds a sword against you, or is shooting at you, comes to you and says to you, please, let me, give me shelter at your home. Comes out of the army, comes to you, after he had shot many of your friends and your brothers and sisters in Islam, and says to you, give me shelter in your home. And commands the Muslim to give him shelter. This is in the Quran. And if any of the disbelievers who are fighting you asked you to give them shelter, you must give them shelter. Which one says that? And then when they go back home, they become normal fighters to you as they were before. The same fighter. Which one says that? Which cultural civilization gives us the na'mah, the blessings of a daughter? When in many Arab cultures, for example, even in many other cultures, even till today, when you have a girl, everybody's quiet. <laughs> and we have that saying in Lebanese. When everybody's quiet in a room, you say, <laughs> A girl is born. When a boy is born, everybody rejoices. Which one brings the ni'mah and says, for any man, or parent, sorry, any man or woman, who has three daughters who they raise on righteousness, there will be a guard for them from hellfire on a day of judgment. Even one daughter did not mention the boy, not the boy, just the girl, only the girl. The ni'mah of Islam, I mean, we cannot, there's too much to mention actually about a family life, about relationships, about a community and a society, for yourself, for your health. The other day I said to my students, it is makruh, to lie down on your stomach and sleep on your stomach. They say, sir, oof, everything's haram, even lying on your stomach? <laughs> I said to them, first of all, it's not haram, it's makruh, meaning disliked. And the reason why it's disliked is because it can harm you physically. Some of the things that can happen to you is that you get backaches. If you are overweight and you sleep on your stomach, you will pressure the intestines and will hurt your lungs and will hurt your heart. Don't, say, don't take it from me, take it from what the doctor said. 
But we already said this 14 centuries ago. And having said this, I just want to show you something else. You know what a Muslim does to a fly when it lands in your food and dies in there? You know what, we know what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do? He said, dip the fly in your food, dip it. Another hadith, dip it three times to make sure that it's all dipped. <laughs> and then throw the fly out and eat the rest of the food. And don't throw the food out because this is a blessing as well. My student said to me, Ugh, sir, what do you mean dip the fly and throw it? This is disgusting. I said, this, it's quite the opposite, this is a blessing. So what are you talking about dipping a fly? It's been in, in feces and stuff like that comes and you've got to dip it in your food. I said, yes, it's a blessing. And you, you don't know, but Allah knows. Guess what? The Prophet ﷺ said, obviously, because a wing carries the bacteria and it drops it, while another wing or parts of its body carry the antibiotic. A few months ago, I don't know if you know about this, because I, I researched a lot about these areas. A professor or a researcher, a woman in America, has discovered something. She said, this is her research about the fly. She said, we were wondering one day, how can a fly live in all these different bacteria and land there and still survive after that? How come that if a human were to attract, for example, filth like feces or urine, we know that medically, if you, if you don't wash your hands or if it's an unhygienic environment, you can develop hepatitis A, B, C, or C, or even D. And some of them can kill you. Yet a fly survives. How does it survive? So she thought, maybe it has an antibiotic that we can extract from and put into the human blood so that we can also develop our immune system. So she went and, and they went and, dis, and researched the fly. They discovered, my dear brothers and sisters, that the fly has an antibiotic within its body and outside on its skin, on the outside of its body. Wallahi, this is a research really there, it's factual. I can for anyone who wants it, email me, I'll, I'll send it to you, inshallah. The most remarkable thing about it is, how do we extract it from the fly? You know what she said? The only way that we know, the easiest way and the most appropriate way or the convenient way is to dip it in liquid. And then, after we dip it in the liquid, we extract that liquid and we can probably inject it into the human blood and probably develop an immune system, just like a vaccine. Just like they extract the poison of a snake, such as in India and other places, and they inject it into the child and develops an immunity towards certain snakes or certain venoms from different spiders and tarantulas. And if you would like to know, also, um, they, they take the urine of a horse as well for women with menopause and they inject it in her as well. She doesn't know that, you see. But they do that and it creates an antibiotic and it's a good thing for her immune system as well. Islam is a blessing, but we just don't know that. So let us not whine about these things and complain about them. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those who've received calamities and whine about it, He replied this, أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمَّا يَأْتِ مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ مَسَّتْهُمُ الْبَأْسَاءُ وَالضَّرَّاءُ وَزُلْزِلُوا حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولَ وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهِ أَلَا إِنَّ نَصْرَ اللَّهِ قَرِيبٌ did man assume that they will enter paradise so quickly and easily like that? And when we bring them the stories of the people before them, they went through trials and calamities, a lot of harm came to them. A lot of masatum al like hardship. Really, they felt it. It clothed them. And misfortune, wazulzilu, the earth was shaken underneath their feet until their messengers and their people used to say, when is Allah's victory going to come? Allah said, behold, just be patient. The victory of Allah is coming soon for you. Don't worry. So this is why Khubayb radiallahu anhu came to the Prophet ﷺ once and he uncovered his shirt after trying to go and give da'wah to a people. And he found burns of holes. Burns and which, which made holes in his back. He said, Ya Rasul Allah, crying and wailing. I went there to give them da'wah and they grabbed me and they took my shirt off and they heated rocks on the fire and dragged my, dragged my back on the rocks until it developed into these holes in my back. 
This is really, this is extreme. The Prophet Sallallahu stood up and he was kneeling down on the Kaaba and then he stood up, sat up straight and he said, You are a people who are hastening for Allah's victory. Be patient. Allah is training us. There will be a time. There were people before you. One of them will be brought in front of the people and they will bring the chainsaw and saw him in half from top to bottom just for them to leave. This is their call and they would not leave it. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu once entered into the house of the Prophet sallallahu for the first time. And as he sat down, he had a smile on his face when suddenly he began to cry. Yabki. The Prophet sallallahu looked at him and said, Ma bika ya Umar? Radiyallahu anhu. He said, Ya Rasulallah. He had looked around his house, you see. And he saw that the Prophet's house was extremely simple. His mat was made of straw. And he could see the marks on the Prophet's body. His pillow was stuffed with coarse leaves. And he could see the effects on his cheek, his blessed cheek. He looked at the corner and he found some barley which was not attended to, still in its mother stem. He looked at his. Uh, his lamp, his lantern, and he found that there was no fuel in it to light it up for some light and heat. He said, Ya Rasulullah, the emperors of Kisra and Qaisar, of Persia and Rome, they are reclining on silk and eating from the most exquisite meals. Everything they want is there for them and wearing from the most expensive clothing. Wa anta Ya Rasulullah, you, O Messenger of God, the best of all human beings, Fihada, like this? The Prophet ﷺ stood up and he smiled to teach us a lesson, not to wail and whine. He said to him, Ya Umar, Ala yurdiq, anna lahum al dunya, wa lana al akhirah. Does it not please you, Ya Umar, that all they will get in the end is this temporary life, and then they will chuck it all behind them, they won't take any of it with them. And we have the hereafter. Obviously, when he's saying to Amr al on the hereafter, Amr al understands what this world means and what the hereafter means. It's an everlasting bliss that never, ever runs out. You'd be crazy if I said to you, if someone said to you, uh, work and work all your life and struggle and struggle for 50 years so that you can receive one minute of pleasure. Would you be sane if you were to go through hardship and plowing for 50 years to receive one minute of pleasure? Would anybody do that? No, no one would do that. So we plow and struggle for the 60 or 70 years of our life, which in the end is only like a day or an hour. Allah SWT says, and they leave behind them an enormous day, which is everlasting in the hereafter. So Umar ibn al-Khattab replied by saying, he wiped his tears and he said, Bala, Bala, Ya Rasulullah. Oh, yes, Ya Rasulullah. This is exactly what we want. The companions of the Prophet, they would always look after for their neighbor and those who were deprived before they fed themselves. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, Umar, radiallahu anhu, all of them. What do you think they used to eat? Olives, olive oil. They'd leave the meat for the people and they would not eat until they made sure that the people in their flock had eaten already before they would touch it. They didn't whine. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came into the house, when, when he used to come to the house and not find food ready or, or food available, he would say, Ya Aisha, is there no food today? She would say, no, Wallahi, Ya Rasul, it's been, we've gone through rough times. The Prophet ﷺ did not wail and whine and say, why, why, why? What did I marry you for? He said, Ethan, Therefore, I'm fasting today. Khalas, I'm fasting. There are people who make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they call upon Allah, call and call and call and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't yet respond. So what do they do? They say, I've asked Allah and I've asked Allah and He hasn't listened to me. I don't want to ask Him anymore. Forget it. And he leaves his prayer and goes away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet warned and he said, a person may ask Allah and ask Allah and Allah would not give him. 
when he's just about to give him, he says, I'm sick and tired of this. When Allah would have, he, 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 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was testing him because he loves to hear his servant call upon him night and day and in order to give him so much in the hereafter, ikhwan, for those who understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will know that when you call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you go through a bit of hardship, Allah loves to hear your voice night and day. Why? Because he's a fair God. On the day of judgment, he will say to those who didn't call upon him, he will say, my servant will take this and that and that and that and that. Why, Ya, ya Rabbi? He will say, because my servant kept calling upon me and this is why he has earned what I have given him. Allah wants to give you more and he will give you in the end, don't worry, in this life. Ayyub alayhi salam. Ayyub alayhi salam, he had 14 children and he had great health and wealth. Everybody loved him. One day after 80 years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away all of his 14 children, one by one. Then he took away his wealth. Then he took away his health until the narration says that his skin used to fall off his body until he could see his muscles and his bones. And he's still alive, breathing. Not only that, the people began to say, if this man was a good person, Allah wouldn't have done this to him. And so he lost his close friends. One day his wife came in and said, Ya Ayyub, alayhi salatu wasalam, isn't it enough now? Can't you ask Allah to get rid of this? It's enough. We've gone through too much. Ayyub alayhi salam then said, My wife, how long did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me blessings for? She said, 80 years or so. He said, I am too shy to ask Allah to cure me yet until 80 years of this time has gone as well. Because given me so much. It was after seven years, however, when he saw his wife resorted to taking from her hair and selling it, that he said, Rabbi, masani yadurru wa anta arhamur rahimin. Even look at the way that the Prophet, he asked Allah to cure him. He didn't say, oh Allah, cure me. Oh Allah, you have harmed me. Oh Allah, you brought this sickness, take it away from me. No, no, no. He said, oh my Lord, harm has afflicted me. He didn't even attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when harm comes to a Muslim, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afflicts you with some kind of hardship, it's actually good for you. I'm going to say the hadith in a minute. And you are the most merciful. Allah says, We took away all the harm away from him. We gave him his family back and his children back and double their amount. We gave him wealth. Grasshoppers, like the shape of grasshoppers of gold, began to rain onto Ayyub alayhi salam. He used to pick him up. And he used to, yani, more than what he had. It's in the hadith it says that he would go around and picking as much as he can so quickly and then Allah sent Jibreel and said to him, Ya Ayyub, are you not already being given enough blessings? Why are you trying to hog, hog everything up? Yani in other words, take all the, don't worry, we're giving you blessings. Why are you so quick in wanting to gather it all? He said, Ya Rabb, who is there that can take enough of your ni'mah, enough of your blessings? I'm gathering your blessing, Ya Rabb. So a Muslim, Allah loves to see his servant taking from his blessing. He loves it. And thanking Allah for his blessing. If when in the hardship, they also thank Allah and they are patient. The Prophet ﷺ said, Strange is the matter of the believer. For anything that happens to him or her is good. Subhanallah. He said, When something good happens to them, they thank Allah. When something bad happens to them, they are patient. Because Allah says in the Quran, we shall surely try you with a loss of wealth and wealth and, and fear and hunger and loss of lives and loss of fruits and food and give glad tidings to those who are patient. The ones who when in a calamity befalls them, they say to Allah, we belong unto him, we shall return. They remember that this is a test. I'm going to wind down now very soon, inshallah. Brothers and sisters in Islam, the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to visit the sick and to visit the graveyards. Why? Because the graveyards remind us that this life is short and that the hereafter is the most important. 
So a man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, when is the last hour going to come? The Prophet ﷺ said, don't ask about that. What have you prepared for it? So the hereafter is what we are preparing for. Visiting the sick and visiting the ill reminds us of the blessing that Allah has given us. We see when we visit the blind person, we remember that Allah has given us eyesight. When we visit a deaf person, we remember that Allah has given us hearing. When we visit a crippled person, remember that Allah has given us legs. The world is yours. You can do anything you like. Anything you like. But this poor crippled person, imagine what they were going through.